The following podcast is being brought to you by the Defy Life Podcast Network. Welcome to Aftergate, powered by the Defy Life Network. Are y'all ready? Aftergate is a podcast series highlighting Colgate alumni of color in their professional endeavors, Aftergate. Are y'all ready? Aftergate is hosted by Alvin Glimpf, a.k.a. Al, and Herman Dubois, a.k.a. Jerry. Are y'all ready? We are doing Aftergate because Colgate University has produced innovators who have changed the world every day, yet many alumni of color and the mainstream Colgate community are unaware of the amazing accomplishments of alums of color. Are y'all ready? Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Aftergate. This is season two. This is your boy, Alvin Glimp. Um, I'm I'm trying to, you know, get the energy because we're here on a Saturday morning. This is a different vibe, but I'm claiming it and I'm loving it because it is still an opportunity to talk to one of our amazing alumni of color. And that's what Aftergate is all about. But before I jump into that, let me introduce my co-host, Jerry Dubois, Mr. Head of Mine. What's going on, sir? How are you doing today? Happy Saturday morning, brother. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Different, di- different type of uh, opportunity, but nonetheless, still feeling blessed. Uh, you know, today's one of them days where you have a whole list of like, things to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you realize that if Mother Nature wants to, she can delete all of that because <laughs> we got a little cloudy, rainy, windy. So some of the outdoor excursions mm-hmm. that were going to happen today ain't happening, which is cool. Um, but then I've, I've learned to realize that instead of being disappointed, just set, this, take a, a pause and recognize that maybe uh, the universe wants to align you in a different direction for that day and focus on some other things like, you know, some self-work, some self-care, some yeah. slow down, hit the brakes, pause and recharge, yeah. recalibrate because the weeks have been grind. So uh, I'm embracing it, brother. I'm embracing it. Uh, the word is pivot, you know, and yes, nothing wrong with yes. pivoting. Um, you play basketball, you play baseball, you play football. Yeah. You know, there are occasions yeah. where you just have to audible. <laughs> audible. And that's okay. That's okay. But what's going on down here in the A? Uh blue skies, sunny day. I'm seeing some signs of autumn. Reminding okay. me of Colgate as I'm seeing some of the colors of how uh, you remember uh, yeah. that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I actually missed that. I think that was one of the prettiest times to be at Colgate is in that fall transition. Cause you know, the hawk was coming, <laughs> um, you know, coming out of New York, you know, we saw green, but Hamilton was a whole nother level of the colors of autumn. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I really fell in love with that time of the year. So even coming down here, I appreciate that. I get to see autumn. It's a little briefer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? right, right, it's right, like, right. it feels like it's two weeks, but it's all good. It's but all you good. still have it. I don't even have an autumn now that you put it in perspective because our palm trees stay green year round there is no transition mm. of, of color in, in 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 the in the foliage and the plants you know oh. so but let's let's jump into our episode for the day mm-hmm. um can i have your uh blessing to introduce our guest for the day is that all right with I, you i am sending you bendiciones <laughs> de la isla de mi gente Please, yes sir let's, let's rock let's go so after gay listeners network you know i'm feeling good about this one yeah right right right. it's my blessing my honor to bring into the room teresa delgado dr teresa delgado as i'm looking at her signature right get that right get that right stop playing games come on class of 1988 Welcome. It is so great to be here. Thank you so much for, you know, for doing this on a Saturday morning for kind of shifting the vibe a bit. And yeah. I'm gonna hope to keep it lively no and doubt. upbeat. No doubt, no doubt. <laughs> no, no, doubt. no. If I if I may say, I don't, I don't want to speak speak prematurely, but I if I if I can share a little bit, I do believe that this was a rescheduling of a rescheduling. I listen for whatever it's worth. Yeah. I, I say it for a reason because uh, Alvin and I go back and forth on this point about um, mm. how 
you know, the buzz is out, after Gate is out, uh, we've received tremendous kudos and compliments from, you know, guests, administrators, uh, current students of color, people who don't know nothing about Code Gate giving it props, you know, um, and we're thankful. But that's not really what drives us. What drives us is that we want to continue to provide a platform for the stories as yours, as others have come before us, Others who have yet to be on the show will tell. And we have people within our circles, like you have people within your circles that graduated within your class, that you're gonna, they're going to hear your link, you're going to send it to them, and, and some of them are going to be inspired to hit us up and say, I want to get on, and some of going to move on with life, and that's fine. But what I really appreciate, as much as there were a few times when there was a little disappointment, oh, we, we had her, and then we're not going to get... I appreciate and respect the consistency to follow through to still say, hey, life happens. I couldn't do it, but I really want to be on. And I think that we don't give enough uh, compliment to those who have had those hurdles. and Because you ain't the first. We've had this happen right. before. True, true but that. there's a difference between those who are persistent about, no, no, I'm going to do this. I said I'm going to do it, so I'm going to do it. Versus those that, okay, maybe there hasn't been that follow through. So I give you even triple props because... <laughs> Uh, we, we, it was destined for this, for this show to happen today now with you. Well, th well, thank you. It, it, you know, when I, uh, when I saw Alvin, we spoke up at reunion and he shared with me about this, uh, this program and this, this project of bringing folks together, you know, and using this virtual space to, to do that. I thought, wow, that's just, that's such an incredible thing because so many of us have, become so disconnected mm -hmm. after graduation mm -hmm. and um and and in many ways um disconnected from from Colgate like once we once we left campus once we had our you know, diploma in hand that was it you know you see I will we just kind of wipe our hands and let <laughs> we're out of there out of there <laughs> and yet you know there are some of us who you know for whom the, I think for all of us there's there's a part of Colgate, even when it's wrought with and fraught with, with challenging and maybe even traumatic experiences, that there was a part of it that really tugs at our heart and that we want to connect back with that, like with mm -hmm. that part that tugs at our heart. So in many ways, Alvin, you, you uh, are connecting back to that part that tugs at our heart for many of us at Colgate. And, uh, and I'm thankful for that. We we always acknowledge the trauma because for so, so, so many of us, that's part of our story. Mm -hmm. But to your point, there is this thing that happened with us, for us, to us on that campus that connects all of us. Yes. So 1988 is when you graduate. Mm -hmm. So that means you graduate high school, 1984. Correct. Where are you from? Where do you grow up? Well, okay, so I grew up part partly in the Bronx, and I have to be careful when I say that because you know, I we left the Bronx when I was in, in 1976, so I was just about what, 10, 11 years old. So, and then we moved to Lower Westchester in Pelham, where my yep. parents still live now. That's so, where my parents are. Oh, in Pelham. Yeah. Wow. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So. Um, so I have to be careful because I can't say, you know, I'm from the boogie down because I, I kind of left the boogie down. <laughs> but you got eight, I don't, I don't understand. In the book. No. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Can you help me understand the distinction? Because I feel like uh, one of our guests, uh, Jelani, was talking about Far Rockaway. And I was familiar with Far Rockaway, but Jerry was not. So I'm not really familiar with this distinction that y'all are describing right now. Give me a sense of what that is. So, so <laughs> I'm you grew up apart in the Bronx, right? And then moved to Westchester County, which is like, like right over the border from New York City in mm -hmm. one of the southernmost suburbs of, of which called, is called Pelham, which is different from Pelham Bay in right. the Bronx. Which is what right. I heard of. I've heard of Pelham yes. Bay. But okay, which is, okay, so now, now, now we're getting deeper because I was thinking, she was thinking Pelham Gardens, which is in that Pelham Bay area yeah. versus yeah. what she's talking about, which is like, you know, Mount Vernon, you know, Yonkers. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. like right adjacent. So you cross from the Bronx into Mount Vernon, Yonkers, yep. and then yep. you cross into 
the community exactly. that he's talking exactly. about. Gotcha. So now, so I grew up, so Bronx, Pelham, and now I live in Mount Vernon. Mm. So there you go. Okay. Money earning Mount <laughs> Vernon. Yes, yes, Mount yes. Vernon, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been in this maybe five to 10 mile radius for mm. the majority of, of my life. It's a good wow. pocket. It's one of the few pockets that still has this community sense, this residential sense. It's uh, It's been come a little more diversified in the last 20, 25 years because there was a time where it was very much like if you were a, a family of color in that community, you're like the Huxtables because it was still mm. predominantly mm -hmm, white, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe a little maybe a little progressive white, but still white, white professionals, white young families. And it was becoming the suburb of the Bronx when even people of color from the Bronx wanted to get out of the South Bronx. That's where they headed. They went there because they couldn't go into Palm Bay and to Throgsnet because it was all Italian. So they had to go on the other side of the Bronx, which is how Mount Vernon and Yonkers became diversified. Right, right. So even in Pelham, we were one of the few yeah. you know, families. Yeah. And and it was very, you know, blue, at least on the on the north side of the tracks. I mean, very much just yeah, the, the you know, divided by the tracks, by the <laughs> Metro North tracks. That's it. The south part of the tracks was Pelham Manor. And that mm -hmm. was very, you know, very wealthy, predominantly white. The northern part of the tracks in Pelham was more um Irish, Italian, blue collar. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we lived and it was Second actually generation very, very difficult growing up there um i mean it was just well you you definitely felt like you mm -hmm. didn't belong it was what? very clear it was made clear where'd you go to high school we didn't belong so when 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 pascal and i you know were thinking about you know where we wanted to buy, you know to buy a house we uh, we said mm -mm, not Pelham, Mount Vernon. <laughs> we're going to be. So I'm that's good. where I'm we good. are now. <laughs> so where did you go to high school? What's high school like? Say that again. Where did you go to high school? What's high, high school, school like? How did you hear about Colgate? Oh well, well, I went to an all girls Catholic high school. You're talking about the train tracks. I actually had to take the Metro North train up to Rye, New York, um, which is about you know 20 minutes north on the on the Metro no uh, North line, mm. and then we would walk from the the train station to the school. Um, it was my parents were committed to uh, Catholic uh, education, education, and so they sent us mm. there. And yeah, so here, honestly, I. I was th I've been thinking about this. I don't know exactly how I heard about Colgate um, because again, my parents, first generation, they, they didn't, they didn't go to college. Mm. They didn't really assist in the, in the, you know, college prep process. I had an older sister who went to university of Rochester. Okay. And so I think there, there were two reasons that, um, I was told, my parents told me, my father told me that I needed to apply to schools in New York State in order to take advantage of the tuition assistance, the TAP program in New York yep. State. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that was my criteria. And I, and I presume that that was part of their experience from when my sister applied to schools and, and why she went to University of Rochester. So Is I was say, okay, University of Rochester, no, it's, uh, it's private. It's private, okay. Yeah. Um, and so it was, you know, Cornell, Colgate, um, Fordham, and, free, and then and then one outlier, which was my, you know, the stretch school of applying to Harvard. Mm. But it was all really New York schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So did you do OUS summer? Do you come up over the summer? I, I did not. I did not. And that was an interesting kind of dynamic because I I almost, um, I felt a little out of place, even as a, a Latino student, because I, I didn't know folks in the way that folks seem so familiar with each other mm -hmm. when I, um, you, you know, when I came up and I almost felt like, I, I didn't know this phrase at the time, but I heard it more recently and I thought, oh, that's kind of how I felt. 
I didn't feel like a Puerto Rican. I felt like a Puerto Rican. Mm-hmm. A Puerto Rican. Rican. Ah, Puerto that's Rican. Rican. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. And well, it, okay. It, it took me some time to, um, you know, to really get acclimated because I felt like I wanted to be a part of the community in that way. You know, growing up in Pelham, going to uh, the, that all girls Catholic high school, we, I was always in the minority. And so I grew up around, you know, in white spaces all the time. And I, and I really did want to feel part of a, of a, a more familiar um, community environment among black and brown students. How would you compare the two like cultures, I guess, because you're coming from a school in high school, like many of us did not, you know, many of us came the majority, then we come to minority. Um, what was the experience like, comparatively speaking, just out of curiosity? Yeah, I mean, it felt like in some ways I, I needed to uh, come to terms with my own identity crisis mm-hmm. that Again, saying that about being, you know, the sort of Rican, in some ways, I almost felt within myself that, am I really a person of color? I mean, I, am I really a, can I legitimately call myself, you know, a Puerto Rican, even though both of my parents are Puerto Rican um, and everything mm-hmm. in my family life has been centered in that way. I almost felt like I have to prove myself. So I have to tell you this story about the um, the trauma of that kind of identity crisis. Mm-hmm. So, you know, our community used to have, I forget what was it, I guess it was Unidad. Unidad. We would have these, um, you know, culture fests. And I got involved in Unidad. I think, I don't know if it was freshman or sophomore year. Must, I think it was sophomore year. And we were talking about, we were all going to come together and cook, you know, um, you know, a meal for this culture fest. And we were going around saying, oh, what, what, what are you going to cook? What are you going to cook? And so I don't know why I volunteered to make... <laughs> Arroz con gandules. Woo! Yeah. Okay. Now, for how many had, people? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and I say that because I had never made it before. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, you know, they, but we were kind of going around and saying, well, who can make the arroz con gandules? And I, in that moment, felt like if I don't say yes, then somehow I'm going to be. Sort of Rican. Sort of Rican. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make it? What? You can't make a Roglandulas? What kind of Puerto Rican is she? <laughs> so I called up my mother and I said, okay, mom, I need, you know, I need you to help me. I'm going to make a Roglandule. And she was, you know, going to, going to Syracuse, getting all the ingredients. But my mother, in her typical ways, like, I, I, you know, I don't really measure. I put it. (laughs) Little of this, a little of that. that Oh, you want a recipe? Uh, No. (laughs) And I'm thinking, no, 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 no. You have to help me, mommy, you know. And then I called my tia, and she did the same thing. Right, right. And I'm thinking, I'm going to have to do this by memory. Oh, you couldn't couldn't Google it? Ah. You you couldn't YouTube it? What? Come right, on. exactly. We're talking old, old, old school. <laughs> so I jump ahead to that, that night. I was mortified because first of all, I didn't even I didn't even use the right kind of pot. It yep. burnt at the bottom. Yeah, bag out, bag out. <laughs> I mean, but bag and, and not cooked at the top. We had to put we had to put the pot outside <laughs> <laughs> in the snow, in the snow, in the snow because the smoke and it was a disaster, That's a disaster. Great. And I like fled from the cultural center. <laughs> I went to my room and hid under my bed for maybe a day 
because <laughs> I was so so Yo, that, that's beyond trauma. embarrassed. That is trauma. That, that is, is trauma, like right? The, that is uh, trauma one on one. Epitome of trauma. And we were talking about, and, and that's crazy because that's trauma even within our own community. Most of us yes, refer to the trauma yes, we experience. Yes, 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 yes. So. But but oh. still but still due to that particular experience yeah. called yeah. Colgate University because yeah. that's a cultural ethnicity thing that to be honest that someone could have helped us deal with it prepare us for it yeah 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 and to, and to feel that you know if 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 I were home or I were in a different situation I could have said you know like you know mommy never taught me how to make a exactly. program, it? so it, but and it wouldn't have been a kind of knock against my identity mm -mm. Mm -mm. it would have just been like well she didn't spend enough time in the kitchen with her. mommy mm -hmm. that was it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know doing other things if i can just share a quick little uh testimony um mm -hmm. i had that very similar type of um experience with my parents with language because my parents mm -hmm. were adamant about you know, my sister and I not speaking with a Spanish accent, um, not making for Spanish our first language, because the idea was that it would be used against us. The idea that uh, you had to perfect your vocabulary and enunciation so you could be basically more embraced and accepted as an educated person of color rather than the typical stereotypical Puerto Rican who came over, didn't basically you know, uh, could not articulate themselves in English in a fashion that would give them, you know, acceptance. And uh, and in hindsight, when we discuss it, um, you know, we I regret. It. I I wish as a kid I could have known better because my parents and my grandparents Spanish is their first language, and um, I could not. I I I I, still, I could hold a conversation, but I can't articulate in nowhere near the fashion that I do in English. And then generationally. That's a result of the same thing that Alvin just referenced about being at Colgate and having that reality. People were like, you're Puerto Rican, but your Spanish is Jack. I'm like, in New York, we speak Spanglish, okay? That, that, that is a category <laughs> that exists in New York City, particularly founded in the Bronx. And so, you know, do your research. But yes, to your point, you know. No, and, and that, I share that experience too, Jerry, because that was very much the, the unspoken rule in our home. And, and our grandmother... Uh, live with us right, right, so my, right my abuela whose picture's right there um you know she she lived with us and she just spoke uh in spanish and i spoke with her in espanol and but my parents only only english and you would think wow you know it, again in hindsight there was a there was a period where i was really angry about that because again that was another way of uh that i had to another hurdle that I had to overcome in order to prove my identity that I'm, you know, not a Puerto Rican, that I'm a Puerto Rican. And then, you know, in addition to that, you can't, um, I couldn't just dis dismiss the, the reality of, of race, right? I am a white Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so if I were a, you know, black or brown Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. Maybe it would have been a little different that I wouldn't have had to feel that I had to assert that, but because I could walk into a room and people think that I'm everything else other than I've heard, you know, Israeli, <laughs> Iranian, Italian, yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, yeah, across, and then no Puerto Rican. Oh, oh. and I know what the what the thinking is like. Oh. <laughs> You don't look or sound like right, right, right. So the so the look and the sound were also part of the of, of the struggle around identity mm -hmm. that I've had to come to terms with. And then, but I also and I think in many ways it led to my desire in my graduate work to explore the 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 Puerto Rican diaspora mm -hmm. from a from a theological perspective because it was helping me to understand all of the elements that have brought us to where we are Absolutely. and 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 how that that was very political it was it was a function of colonialism and mm -hmm. white supremacy mm -hmm. and i had to find a way to understand that so that i wouldn't blame myself for the fact that i didn't speak spanish or that 
you know, I, I, I was born into the skin that I'm in. With, with, with that being said, while I call you, share, give us a little walkthrough, because you talked about having that experience with not feeling like, since you didn't have the summer OUS experience, you get to Colgate. Where, where'd you live your four years? And, and just a little bit briefly about sort of like how that impacted this identity search, the sense of acceptance, the culture shock of Colgate. Yeah. So in, in my first year, I lived in uh, what was called Cutton. Uh, I think it's not going to be called Cutton anymore. hundred something like one thirteen broad, you know, they've mm. took, taken the name oh. off of Cutton um, because of uh, the uh, Cutton's, um, uh, you know, his beliefs and and values around around race, very mm. racist uh, views there. So his name is off the bill. Anyway, that's where I lived my first mm. year, and it, I was in Brigham Hall within that that c- complex. Mm-hmm. So it was right you know, right near Brian. Mm -hmm. And I, um, and I began to, you know, to find connections and associate with, you know, folks in Unidad, folks in in the Black Student Union. Um, And then I I became, you know, friends with, and then eventually started kind of dating on the, you know, on the down low. (laughs) Um, Right, 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 right. (laughs) uh, Who was class of 85. So I knew a lot of, uh, of his folks, you know, Pascal Cabemba, class of 85, and, and Wayne Palma, class of 85. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so then after he graduated, and um, I, in my sophomore year, I lived up on the hill, I started, I became an RA. Mm-hmm. So in some ways, becoming an RA was a way to find some type of community, mm-hmm. like a different, because I really wasn't a part of the OUS group. Um, I was still committed to, you know, around issues that were affecting students of color on campus. And then I, and then I became an RA for, you know, for financial reasons, but yep. also it was mm-hmm. a way to, to develop bonds within a, within a community, find some kind of community of belonging. Res life, yeah. Yeah, and and the res life folks were, you know, were d- very diverse, mm-hmm. were more progressive. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that community felt right to me. So I lived in, I was the RA in Stillman, East, okay. East Stillman. Um, and then in junior year, I became a head resident. HR. HR. <laughs> Back in, back in Cutton, mm-hmm. so I lived in the Cutton core, um, and then my senior year, I was the head resident in Andrews. Mm. Mm. Okay, so you had good res life experiences, even as a student going from RA to res life uh, to to HR, because you got uh, those apartment opportunities within the within the Cutton Hall suite, so to speak. So that's yeah, nice. exactly. That's nice. No, that's it was nice. it was good, and I and I feel like I needed that because you know I, as much as I was, very outgoing in, um, you know, with with the 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 RA community and and with the general you know with the student of color community, I was also very I, you know I was a bookworm, you mm. know my my studies were really important to me. I needed to do do well. That was kind of kind of hammered into my head that, you know, a, a B does not it does not suffice. Mm-hmm. Um, so so yeah, I needed the space in order to be able to have private time to to, to get yeah. my work. So when you look at those years, what do you reflect on as highlights as accomplishments, uh, in that, in those four years at Colgate? Um, well, I I think. The fact that um, in my senior year, you know, I was awarded the 1819 award um, mm-hmm. was pretty significant because I, I, you know, I was, I was kind of a rabble rouser, <laughs> you know, I was, I was not a, you know, a, a shrinking violet. Mm. Um, I was kind of known to, to push the administration on on issues that were affecting students, um, particularly students of color, and so to be able to ha- to to get that award, mm-hmm. uh, even in the midst of that, like I was a trouble, I was a troublemaker. But I, you know, in the words of John Lewis, you know, making good trouble. 
Right. Mm-hmm. You got you got respect for it though. You know, and it, and it, in many ways, if it it helped me going back to the whole issue around the identity crisis, it it, it helped me to heal some of that trauma. Came full circle. Because because I think folks and and particularly the students of color knew to whom I was accountable. Mm-hmm. Like I I. I wasn't going to be a sellout mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> that I, when it, when it came down to, you know, when it came down to things that really mattered, they, they knew the community knew who and for whom I was going to fight. Mm. And that award, I'm going to get a little teary. Mm-hmm. That, okay. that award meant it, it may mean something for the, like the, the wider Colgate community, as the you know most prestigious alumni award but to me it meant that i was being affirmed mm-hmm. by the com- the community i loved mm-hmm. the community that was important to me mm-hmm. and yeah i i would say that that's one of the one of the greatest ac- accomplishments that's what's up what did you ma- what did you major in I eventually majored in religion. Hey. You said eventually, so can you give us the? <laughs> yeah, that, the, the, that's, the, that's the, my the, major. I, I led that. I I led it in that way <laughs> eventually. So when I started, when, when I started out, my intention was to be a math major, a ma- math and art, mm. because uh, I loved to draw and I loved math, and I thought I I want I wanted to be an architect. So, and I felt that that was, you know, you know how first generation folks are thinking about what mm-hmm. kind of very concrete job can I get after, mm-hmm. um, you know, after I graduate. Um, and so I was, I had already taken a number of math, like AP math classes, honors oh. math classes in high school. Mm-hmm. So I had already those credits and my intent, my, I started in like, math classes that a lot of juniors were in and pascal <laughs> um warned me he's like <laughs> why are you taking all those like i think i was taking two math classes um in one semester and he's wow. and he was a he was a physics major so he was like why are you t- doing that to yourself and i said well because i can i can do it <laughs> and what i found um uh, in that ex- in that experience of taking those math classes was that there was a very clear line uh, among the professors, all male, all white in the math department, who both implicitly and explicitly made me feel that I was not, I didn't, I wasn't cut out for doing math. I told, so I, I shared this, I've shared this experience before, but I had in one of the classes, it was applied matrix algebra. It's weird that I had, I mean, you remembered the details like that. And I had, was having a problem with one of the you know, problem sets. And for me, it was like, okay, you haven't got a problem with, the, with this problem set. You go to the professor for help. It's, you know, it's, it's not a, uh, a reflection on your intelligence. Mm-hmm. So I went to the professor for assistance during office hours. And I tell you, I I was sitting out in front of his office and he was in the office with with a few other students and I was kind of waiting my turn. And it was like, he was just talking about every, they were talking about math, but then they were going into other stuff and talking about football. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm out here waiting. (laughs) you know, to talk to this professor. And then when I went in, so he spent a lot of time with these two, you know, male students. They left the office. I went in and he essentially said, if you can't get this particular problem, you should, you really should reconsider staying in the class. It was like a two minute conversation. Wow. And I would, and it essentially told me, maybe you don't, you don't have, maybe you don't have a mind for math. And I was mortified by that. Mm. I thought, how am I, you know, how I, I'm not even able to get help from the professor. How am I going to get through this whole class? So I, mm. I left and I think I eventually dropped that class. I think I got a C 
in the other class that I, the other math class that I was in. And I thought, how am I going to be a math major if I can't even get through these classes and not able to get the help? And that's so at the time, remember, we had to take the core classes. Mm-hmm. And one of my core classes was in the religion department. Um, and I felt it was with Wanda Warren Berry. Mm. And it was an intro to religion. And I felt in that class that I was heard and I had a voice and I would, that voice was affirmed. Mm. I felt like I didn't feel like an idiot. Mm -hmm. I mean, the bar was that low, right? Like I didn't, it didn't make me feel like an idiot. Mm. And I took another religion class. And yet again, I was like, wow, I actually understand this. And I, I can interact with the professor in a way that feels meaningful hmm. like it should <laughs> and that's like it should right, as it should exactly and then that's what led me to decide to be a religion major thank you thank you thank you one religion major to another appreciate articulation <laughs> of what makes being a religion major so special but we're gonna and, put and a if point. i may say that is actually a great story on how the major found you or you found the major in a very graceful way that came out of some unfortunate circumstances, but then allowed you to explore this whole liberal arts education that Colgate yes. is so well known for. For a lot of people who don't understand why liberal arts sometimes it makes great. a difference. But we've had some hard, we've had some amazing, less than best practice stories on how people ended up in their majors, and uh, that wasn't one of them. So that was actually, you know. Uh, no, but 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 shout out to that math professor who was whack for. <laughs> right. right, right, right. Let's not forget that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and in many ways, you know, that has that experience has informed me. Mm. You know, it informed me as a professor. Uh, well, in, even before it informed me as a graduate student. Um, in my in my graduate student teaching, and informed me as a professor in the classroom with undergraduate students. You know, not just about what kind of professor I didn't want to be, mm-hmm. but what kind of professor I did want to be, particularly exactly. for those students who, you know, would feel like they were on the margins for whatever reason. And, and it has informed in, uh, very, very much the kind of dean that I am now uh, in, you know, for a college of liberal arts and science, because I have to make the case to those first generation students and parents about why a liberal arts education is is so transformative and and so uh necessary and critical so we're going to put a pause right there and use that as a segue to go into the second half of the conversation and we'll learn how you get from colgate to being this administrator and we'll be right back after this quick pause So this episode is sponsored by Hope Murals. Hope Murals is a nonprofit that provides adolescent youth with an interactive experience of creative expression via an urban arts platform that stimulates both mental and physical development. Please visit their website at www.hopemurals.org to learn more and find ways you can support the work they do. Welcome back. Welcome back. This is second half of After Gate. Before we jump back into the conversation, let me make sure we show some love to our sponsor for this week, Hope Murals. Show them some love. Go on their website, hopemurals.org. They're doing some amazing things to expose our kids to urban arts. Also show our network some love, the Defy Life Network at www.godefylife.com. They got some really amazing articles and some good content on there as well. I'm going to pass the mic to my man, Jerry, so he can start us off. Well, here we are this beautiful Saturday morning with the illustrious Sister Delgado, class of 88, uh, repping uh, the Bronx. We're going to stay true to that, you know. Uh, and uh, one or two... Uh, sort of segue into a subject matter that is near and dear to my heart uh, on many levels, uh, personally, culturally, emotionally, politically speaking. Um, as, we, as we understand and experience the very real reality of climate change 
and in particularly, uh, I reside in Miami, so I'm in a very tropic type of uh, uh, region, which, which is impacted in many ways, much like the Caribbean is impacted. Sometimes I, I feel so fortunate because I know we have infrastructure here in a way that is somewhat somewhat suitable to deal with uh, the natural disasters, but know that my brothers and sisters, the hermanos and the hermanas in, down in the Caribbean, and pick any island, <laughs> not just one, but in particular with having family in Puerto Rico that have been devastated back to back to back to back to back. Uh, you know, it kills me just to, to, to not see the type of support given to at least Puerto Rico, which is still part of our, uh, our infrastructure and our responsibility, even though it's a modern day colony. Um, I'd be very interested in your take on sort of the politics behind uh, how we recognize the need to address climate change and in particularly in regions, whether it be the West Coast and fires or whether it be the in Puerto Rico with the uh, lack of infrastructure there to, to help our sisters out. Um, what's your take on, you know, where, where, what, what should be happening? What's not happening? Is there fingers to point? Uh, I, I really would love your, your spin on that because I struggle with that all the time. Yeah, I thought, no, thought, thank you for for raising that because it is really a, a, an important, you know, I I think, you know, for me, um, it is the, it is the, the, like the moral imperative of our time um, mm -hmm. to address the climate, you know, crisis. And, you know, it, in many ways, this is not anything that has been, um, you know, this issue ha has been put forth for many years like this is not a, a recent issue right and mm -hmm. there have been people who have been um you know making the you know sort of trying to shout to the from the rooftops you know from the 1950s that uh, that this is an issue that needs to be addressed and so i just um well, there are a lot of there are a lot of fingers to point. I think, you know, in my view, mm. but I think this is a you know, every major every major industry, every every institution needs to put this at the at the front and center. Um, and it's not so. You know, there's there's also the the racial component of this, right? Because this is not about you know, preserving, you know, this is not about conservation in the sense of we need to preserve our wildlife, you know, we need to preserve lands in order to, you know, to provide, you know, spaces for the privilege to be able to have access to. It's about um, preserving the land in order for those people for whom the land, you know, is their livelihood mm. to be able to continue to live. Um, so I think about it, you know, I took a group of students when I was in my, in my former uh, job with Iona, um, I took a group of students in 2019 to Puerto Rico for a course that was connecting to helping them to understand the connection between politics, religion, and the environment. And that course was supposed, I had been wanting to, to do that for a number of years. And I actually got a grant to bring students in 2018. Mm -hmm. And then, and I had it all lined up. And then of course, hurricanes Irma and Maria happened in the September of 2017. And that changed the, you know, changed everything. But we, we were able to go, in 2019 and flying into San Juan, uh, all you could see were blue tarps over so many buildings. Um, and of course, you know, we had just come through this, you know, very tumultuous and we were in the midst of a tumultuous, you know, administration that was uh, beyond antagonistic to, to Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans. And and all of that was informing these students as we were landing in in Puerto Rico. We went to um, we went to two places. Went to El Yunque, doing mm -hmm. uh, you know trail recovery in the rainforest, and um, 
you know, and tree recovery in the rainforest, still a year and a half after those two hurricanes, they were still trying to clear paths and um, and and to replant some of the the the, the trees that had mm. been completely wiped off. Then we went down to the coast. We went to Manati, and we're working with an organization called Para la Naturaleza that is trying to to buy back land in Puerto Rico in order to re-preserve it. And we went to a former sugarcane plantation. And if you know the history of, of the way sugarcane was, um, was, was planted and harvested, it totally devastated the natural ecosystem in many parts of, of the islands. No, so, I did not know that. So it it because it depletes the soil it it the way in which it has to be harvested it's not um it it damages the environment more than it it helps it so they're trying to take these plantations back buy them back and and then replant the you know native um native plantings native trees and and native uh, flora in order to preserve it for the people not so not for any kind of industry and mm -hmm. i think that's what's most and then you also see we went into the the interior mm -hmm. um where there are communities that are that are beginning to refarm refarm the land mm -hmm. and do subsistence farming um that is taking back that tradition that was taken away um, you know, during the Operation Bootstrap period. So there is all of this, by this reclaiming of the land, but these, these quote unquote natural disasters, right? Uh, I don't think that they're very natural because they are exacerbated by our, our use and abuse of, of fossil fuels, but, mm. but they're taking those, those disasters and using that as an opportunity to reclaim the connection with the land that colonialism mm. has severed. Mm. Mm. And that to me is, you know, indigenous communities, you know, against all odds are doing that. Black communities are doing that, you know, in, in the South. Mm -hmm. So mm. I, I think that there's um, you know, the ways that we can bring that to light and and support those efforts, in addition to addressing those the bigger issues, as 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 people of color, we we need to be account be accountable to the land mm -hmm. in the ways that the land has has always been accountable for us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Power to yeah. the people. Yeah. Um, I, I will share this later, but uh, I want to share, you know, sort of my awakening to that reality, although I know I learned it had always been going on and, and, and realized the difference between the stories that were told from my uncles and aunts and grandparents that I didn't have the context to really understand, you know, what was Puerto Rican nationalism and the reasons behind it and the prisoners of war that people don't talk about anymore that were from that movement in Puerto Rican history. And so, uh, and, and yet it was a huge inspiration for the nonprofit that I started because it was birthed out of the, the Hurricane Maria disaster that mm -hmm. uh, Hope, which is now Hope Murals, was a campaign then called Puerto Rico Hope, where we raised some funds and did some community work here in Miami to raise awareness about the fact that people were really struggling in Puerto Rico. And a month later, it wasn't even being covered in the news anymore. And so mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 thank you for your work and thank you for the, for the for taking ownership as a, as a as an educator and as a leader to pass that storytelling on to younger generations because the the cause is still there the need is still there and yet the movement I, I would say has has been for my personal taste has lacked luster and has lacked mm -hmm. revolutionary tactics that I feel are very necessary um, in this time of of awakening that we're going through around the country in various mm -hmm. communities. So no, I I agree and I think that in some ways. Uh, my my sense is you know that that there is more of an awareness about the need for for a continuing this the the independence fervor mm. you know for puerto rico because these these disasters have shown that 
and demonstrated over and over that <laughs> quote unquote American democracy, you know, in, in quotes, right? right. <laughs> um, does not work, is, is incompatible with, with pseudo, pseudo colonialism. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not, and yeah. and the only way that you can um, can remedy it is if you break if you break from it. Mm. But I think that there's a lot of fear, and I understand that, you know. And and I also am mindful that I am saying this as a diaspora Puerto Rican, mm-hmm. not one mm-hmm. who's who's living, you know, on the island itself. So, you know, I I, I am conscious of that. I can't wait to off camera to talk to you a little bit more about this because I got some ideas that I've bounced off a few people that I feel have the capacity to understand, yo, that could actually work, but mm-hmm. it's a combination of, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a 20 year plan to, for independence for the island, but, mm-hmm. but comes with accountability to the US government in the form of, uh, which dates back to the, uh, the Jones Act and, and, and the monies that have been manipulated from the island as a result of that mm-hmm. and so let's get our infrastructure and island and functionality up and use the 20 years to transition into that be an ally but be independent so we'll, we'll, we'll pause on that and bring it back to Colgate uh mm-hmm. but thank you thank you thank you so much I appreciate the insight on, on that now as we kind of bring this full circle now you gave us the journey of pre-Colgate you gave us the journey of the four years at Colgate and your own growth and and and, and sort of experiences there positive and negative, moving forward. Now walk us through the highlights from 88 that spring to where you're at today and give us some of the highs and lows of, of your journey professionally, personally, spiritually, culturally as, as, as you see fit. Yeah, well, I'm gonna do this in what, in, in five minutes or less. Um, that's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's up to but you, that's up to I you. Have to lead, I have to lead with, um, you know, with, with my, my partner in life who, someone I, I met at Colgate and you know I've I read I wrote one of those Colgate love stories about yeah, it, yeah. Colgate couple which is you know Pascal Kabemba um, class of 85 who I met that first year um in in Cutton you know he you know he graduated he came he came to work in New York um that's another story in itself um, but then we, when I graduated in 88, we actually got married in 88. Mm-hmm. Um, we eloped and we didn't tell anybody or wasn't supposed to really tell anybody because he's from the Congo and was really not supposed to marry somebody here. He was supposed to go back <laughs> and from mm. a very traditional uh, Luba family. And he was supposed to marry somebody from the Luba, you know, mm. tradition. And he he sort of, yeah, he he let that go. <laughs> and that didn't go over all too well. So we eloped in 88, and then we were married in a church in 89. Um I was working at at Chase Manhattan Mac. So going back to that whole liberal arts education, right? So mm-hmm. a religion major from Colgate. <laughs> And I end up at I Chase. Get my first job is Chase, <laughs> Manhattan Bank, right? In management program. So why why not? <laughs> the liberal arts, you can do anything. You can. Um, and I was there for three years. I was in their program for a year and a half, placed in a management position. Uh, certain things happened. Made a decision. This is not for me. I do, do not want to be the cog in the wheel. I, I made some good trouble while I was there, burned some bridges, unfortunately, or fortunately, when Chase I was, was there. never the same. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, and that's when I decided to, to enroll in graduate school. Uh, I wasn't sure where I wanted to go and I, and what I wanted to do. And I called up one of my dear mentors from Colgate, uh, Coleman Brown, Reverend Coleman mm. Brown, mm-hmm. who's again, his picture's right there with me at all times sort of all over my shoulder and he was a, a real guiding light for me and I he helped me to discern that my next steps would be going to seminary mm. um, so I enrolled at Union Seminary in 1991 um, in their master's program and then was accepted to their PhD program in 93 at that same year I had my first child 
Um, so I started my PhD um, pregnant and gave birth that December. And I graduated with the PhD um, 12 years later with, uh, with four children. Wow. Hello. And uh, <laughs> a multitasker. So, you know, <laughs> a little bit. And I say that the dissertation was the hardest thing to, to birth. <laughs> all of them. That was the, the hardest child to birth. The others were easy. Um, How but, far are they apart in terms of ages? Yeah. So, so Francesca is, um, was in 93. Then Celeste was born in 95. So two years. Then Josiah. Mm -hmm was born in mm, Josiah. Yeah, Josiah Young from Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Josiah yeah, yeah. Young. Not that too. name was very, very important to me. Um, and so he was born in 98. So there's three years there. And then I, I was pregnant, pregnant in 2001, 2001 and I right. lost that pregnancy. Um, and then my youngest son, Xavier, was born in 2002. Mm. So he, they're, they're the between number three and number four they're they're four years apart but only because again I, I lost one in between but in totality it was it was the farm system was constantly in business throughout <laughs> all of the professional, of professional right. yes right right, yes. right and in in between there you know I was working on the um I do my graduate work raising the children um you know being present with them at all times and doing a lot of fun stuff with them. But, and also I worked as a preschool teacher uh, in exchange for their being able to go to the preschool. I worked as an assistant director as a camp, at a camp in order for them to go to the camp. So it was just kind of, it was back and forth and I, I loved it. Um, that's that that's that liberal arts for you right yeah, there. Yeah, you do it all. Can do Who it can all. go from chase to the classroom in one step with <laughs> wow. a baby while I'm doing right, my right. PhD? Exactly. <laughs> so you know, in, in many ways, um, it was um, it, it was what our it, it's what our folks do, right? I mean, we just as they say, make we make a way out of no way, and that is we carve that path and we we sort of we. We kind of make build the 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 bridge as the as the book. We build the bridge as we walk. Mm. Right. Mm. Or, or or we we often reference we and we actually said this the first season a couple of times that we were building the plane and flying it at the same time. So, yeah. Yeah. which 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 isn't always the best practice. And as you know, <laughs> and there's been you know there's been a lot of turbulence over those years. Mm. You know. Um, financial hardship and um medical challenges um but i'm i'm very grateful that you know the core the core aspect of of all of all of my parts of my life is is really about family and 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 faith and and that holds true so you, you sort of suggested earlier just kind of get us so, so, so in, in this current state where, where do you serve so after I graduated from, from Union with my PhD, I started working at Iona College as, in the relig as a professor of religious studies. And I was there from 2005 to just this past June. And when I was- Is that there in New Rochelle campus? In New in Rochelle, yep. I was, so again, that 10 mile radius. <laughs> <laughs> you consistent, back. you consistent. <laughs> you know, I mean, 10, really 10 minutes from, from door to door, mm. uh, from Mount Vernon uh, to the campus in Nourishell, there for 17 years. And then this year, I, I had been thinking for the last, I would say, three to four years about moving into administration, wanting to do that, and but, but wanting to do that here at an institution in New York, not wanting to, to leave so I waited for the right opportunity and, and I applied and I'm now the Dean of the, of the College of Liberal Arts and Science at St. John's University in, in Queens. Hello, oh, St. John's. Yes. yes. Okay. That's a big deal. Dean, that, that, that's yeah. cool. Though. And both of us have worked in higher ed in various capacities. So understand the, the higher ed structure, whether it's a yeah. private or, or public institution. And um, as both being also educators, I feel like educators got to lift and wave each other's flags because the rest, of the, the rest of the world and sure as hell the government don't do it. So uh, props to, to your commitment to higher ed and, and, and moving into the administration 
leadership of the world. Yeah, and St. John, that's a that's big time. St. John's ain't it no is. Uh, it's great. Ain't no we, little college. <laughs> no, we are St. John's, right? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, in the in the Big East, you know, I grew up, you know, no <laughs> yeah, the big St. John's fan. The, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was funny because you know, as a New Yorker, you know, St. St. John's is like the Big East school. Correct. And the, uh, it's the then, only school. <laughs> well, but then Pascal, you know, was a big Georgetown fan. Um, oh, yeah, John Thompson, John Thompson oh, and Patrick Ewing, and all. I got that. I got that. So I, I, I understood that. And, I, and then I, you have Syracuse. And of course, in Syracuse, where my son, my son went to Syracuse. So, but if you're from New York, especially from our era, yeah, our St. Era. John's is a school you root for. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I still root for them. Still root for yeah. Carnesecca and all. So yes. yeah. They're very, very diverse uh, in their student body. So it's really great to um, to be there and to serve as a dean because it, it's affirming everything that is important to me in higher ed and making higher ed accessible and available to to all people. Well, congratulations. That's an awesome seat to sit in and exactly why we do this show so we can share that we have people, alums that are sitting in those seats and doing that good work as well, being uh, a servant in that way. Quick question. If you had the opportunity to offer some words of wisdom to Teresa, the Teresa that's entering Colgate, I'm curious, what would those words be? And what would be the words that you would whisper into your ears as you were leaving Colgate? Hmm. Whew, you leave a tough one for the, for yeah. the last. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a, t- a take, tough take, question. Take us out on that. <laughs> yeah, well, I would I would say, um, and I don't want to disappoint on on the words of of wisdom. Words of wisdom to myself as I was entering Colgate, I would say, you're you're more than okay just the way you are. Mm. That's it. That's it. Kind of hitting back to that, you know, the whole identity crisis. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You don't have to prove yourself to anybody. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, how about the Teresa that's leaving? You got this. Okay. Okay. All right. okay. That's what's up. That's what's up. Before we go, anything you want to promote, share, just throw out to the Aftergate universe, let them know um, things they might want to support or get involved in. Yeah. Well, I also want to share, you know, that, that, since 2016, I've also been on the board of trustees of Colgate University. Aha. Aha. Nice. I did not want to leave without mentioning that. And, yeah. and to say awesome. that I know how, again, we talked about this before, how, how difficult it is for many of our folks in our community to stay involved with Colgate um, because of those many experiences. And I, I want you to know, I, I want the community out there to know that as a trustee, um, as, as I'm on, as long as I'm on the board and th- there are a number of us on the board now, um, we have a commitment to that. Um, and I'm always raising that issue about, about diversity and inclusion on the board, um, that as long as we're there, we're going to to be that voice, but we can't do that alone. Mm. So the more that you can be, the folks out there can be engaged, even in the smallest ways. It's not about, it's not always about, even though it seems like it's always about the money. It's not about that. You know, there are ways to be engaged with our current students, um, being up on campus, making yourself available in the, um, in your profession to serve as a mentor um, and to be present. Like I think oftentimes our interests or ideas or voices get dismissed because there aren't enough of us. I mean, there aren't enough of us in, you know, in general, because we're so, so few at Colgate, but that becomes even more, it's less and less you know, within the, the engaged alumni base. So to find ways to get connected, um, and e- even though taking that, that step is hard, but know that you, you know, reach out to me, reach out to, to other members of um, the alumni of color community who are on the board or in the administration 
and keep us accountable. Thank you for those words. What we don't hear enough of is the Latin American experience at Colgate. And it is um, refreshing to hear those distinctions, but similarities um, in terms of the identity issues and concerns that we all share that connect us and be mm -hmm. of color on that campus. It's been a great conversation. Great. Absolutely. Great, great Absolutely. opportunity to get to know you today and your story. And Colgate Couple, shout out to the Colgate Couple. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, out. yeah. And let your partner know we're coming for him. We got to sign <laughs> out. Come on. Oh, dude. No. We need his story. He, let's go. No, no. Let's get it on record. He agreed in June that he okay. was going to be on the show. Okay. So yeah. that's, that's but has he has he scheduled? No, that's has okay. He hey, 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 one on. at a time, sir. Let's we Listen, just work at it. After <laughs> Sister Delgado tried three times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So no. No, it'll be it'll be great. I, I'm sure he will. Um, he will schedule something with you soon. So. And I know you'll do this already. Alvin will work on a little bit of the post-production edits and share okay. the link with you prior to it being posted, usually in the same week. Usually we air every Saturday at 1300 hours, um, a new episode. And so uh, we encourage you to share it with family and friends and particularly mm -hmm. those within the Colgate Network, AOC Network that you believe may or may not be as engaged or have heard of the podcast and just say, hey, yo, check this out. What you think of this? You know, Honestly, led, led I'm going to share this. I'm going to share this with the Board of Trustees. Okay. Okay. There we I'm go. Gonna, I'm gonna there send go. the link to them and well, and in case in case you don't know, Colgate thus far OUS the administration has embraced us. They brought us up to campus in the spring, uh, and we did our first live podcast on campus in Bryan Complex in a new area that's like a, a kind of quasi dining area, multi purpose area. Has current students of color there. Had a great uh. uh turnout as well as a great story told um and to the point where they've been receptive to having us come back again um but to have folks on the board of trustees level listening which may or may not be happening and in particularly to all the stories so they can really see across decades what have been some of the common struggles mm -hmm. for students of color exactly. what have been and what and coming from folks not only who experienced it but talk to how it influenced their trajectory in life, both professionally and personally. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it is very valuable content for them to think about how they shape policy and how they make decisions on funding and how they go after faculty of color, what their demographics look like for students of color, all very valuable content if they're listening. Exactly. I know. And I, I agree. And since and since there aren't so very many of us around that board table and, and really only very limited opportunities to hear each other's stories, you know, one of the things I've noticed over the over the years that, that I've served is that they just don't know a lot of our the white alums. They don't know. Don't know a, 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 anything no. about our experience. They're like, wait, I, that huh. is it. It wasn't their experience. So how could it have really? Been <laughs> we were up there. Uh, Harvey Sandima said that to us. He said, yeah. Alvin, you just don't understand. They have no idea what you guys are I know. Doing. They just don't. And, and, and it makes sense because Alvin um, always, you know, references uh, that part of the stimulus behind this creating this, and this was definitely uh, all Alvin's brainchild, was really from the perspective of most of Colgate, whether administrators or alum, don't know where current students of color are in their like like you know what that they become what that and that there are incredible success stories of mm -hmm. Colgate alum that happen to be alum of color mm -hmm. that y'all don't necessarily know about in the way you know about traditional alumni of Colgate because there's an intentional disengagement and disconnection. And so to be able to make connect some dots and draw and create some bridges between the lack of knowledge of this experience and the greatness. And, and mm -hmm. I think if anything, the grit and the resilience that even somehow I feel like this becomes part of, at least for me, when I'm talking to potential students about the Colgate experience, I'm like, it's not just about the academics. It's, it's, it's about, do you have that grit to mm -hmm. understand what's going to be coming at you and the situations you're going to be in that are going to challenge your persona, your ident your sense of self, never mind your academic performance. And to have to go through that for four years, find yourself, still perform academically, be impacted, be traumatized, and then still succeed. 
we rock with you, Sister Delgado. <laughs> you know, and and I think they 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 need to hear, they need to hear us, and they need to see us. Mm, absolutely, you know? they amen. That. And they don't. And currently, well, you're giving this opportunity for them to hear us and and to see us. So thank you both. Thank you. This has been another episode of Aftergate Season 2. Thank you to our guests. Thanks to our listeners. As always, Aftergate is powered by the Defy Life Network. This has been an another amazing podcast, so we appreciate it. You know you can check us out on all of your favorite podcast streaming platforms. Many more dope episodes to follow. Remember, the Colgate of your day is not the Colgate of today, and it's not the Colgate of the future. So show up. Peace, family. You hear that? Listen closely. That, my friend, is the deafening sound of focus. It drowns out all the useless noise that can clutter the moment. Naysayers don't exist. Haters? Smaters? The peanut gallery? Who's that? When you're in your zone, all that noise and all that buzz is just elevator music. So, enjoy your journey, focus on your goal, and bask in the quiet roar that is progress. Because when it's your time to shoot that shot, Spit that verse or close that deal. The only voice that matters is yours. Defy life.